Good morning. morning. Welcome to Worship at Lamb of God. Welcome to the fourth Sunday in Advent. Welcome to our celebration of Life Sunday. We'll be doing that through our readings and our hymns and also through the message today, the sermon. I want to welcome all of you that braved the weather to come out and be here live and in person in our our sanctuary and those that joined us for... uh, our Bible study in the Fellowship Hall. And I want to welcome all of you that are worshiping at home. Thank you for tuning in with us and joining us on live stream. It is an example of what a great blessing that is, I think, especially days like today. Now, I'm not sure if you would call us the true Michiganders with great spirit, or you would call us the fools that are not at home doing what you're doing. But either way, it's good that we gather together. The Spirit is with you at home. The Spirit is here with us in worship. May he lift us up and bring us God's message today. I want to thank Pastor Hensler for joining me. He's going to be joining me uh, for the next several Sundays to give me a break so I'm not on my feet as much. And as I uh, told you last week, I've been given a gracious gift of skin grafts on the bottom of my big toe. The idea here being as if they graft some skin on there, perhaps it'll join with the skin on my big toe and close the wound. So I had an appointment last Thursday, and he said it's down to a slit. So praise God, it is still working. Yeah. This, this procedure, as I said last week, would have cost me out of pocket thousands of dollars. And my podiatrist is doing it for free because, well, that's how God works. He's big on grace. And I thank him for the grace that he showed me in my life and the healing power that he showed me. Thank you to all that came to scrapbooking last night. We had a smaller group last night, but we had a gift of two people who drive by and saw the scrapbooking on our screen and decided to stop in. They're members of South Baptist Church up the road, but we welcomed them as sisters in Christ. It was great to have them here, and it was great to have you that joined with them and made it an eventful thing. Uh, As long as we're dug out next week, Bible studies will happen as normal. I'm pretty sure we will be. Uh, Sunday, 9 a.m., Bible study, of course, next Sunday. We had that this morning, a longer look at the lessons. We'll have our Monday, 1 p.m. Bible study on Hebrews, and my good friend and leader, uh, Pastor Hensler, will be here to take that over again uh, tomorrow. And then both of our Bible studies on Wednesday. Also coming up this week, it's our turn to serve at Franklin Avenue Mission. So we're looking for volunteers, those that would care to come and cook. Uh, Susan says she would like you here at Tuesday at noon and Thursday at 10 a.m. if you want to come here and help cook in the kitchen. We also need people that are willing to go down there and serve at Franklin Avenue Mission, and they're looking for help with that on Tuesday and Thursday from 3 to 6 p.m. Don't forget our Heartbeat Crib is up in the narthex. Uh, We're also gathering laundry detergent and cleaning items to donate to Flint Mission Network. You can put those in the... uh, Fellowship Hall on the table to the left. Check the sign-up sheet and see if there's a date that you could sign up to provide snacks for our upcoming fellowship hours. And Lent is around the corner. In fact, Ash Wednesday is about a month from now. More information about Lent and what we're going to do, our sermon series and all that is in your uh, news and notes. I invite you to look at that. We're going to do something a little different this year. We're doing what's called a round robin. So I will preach a sermon here. And then I will go to one of our uh, fellow churches in our circuit, and their pastor will come here and preach to you. So it'll be a chance to experience the pastors of different circuits and a chance for me to get to know those congregations because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And it should be a very interesting thing. Uh, Check out your news and notes for information on that. Because of the weather, we weren't really sure how the roads would be. I hear they're better. Uh, But I talked with Nick Grimm, our council president, and we decided the best thing for us to do is to postpone our congregational meeting until uh, a week from today. So that will now happen on Sunday, February 5th. And I sent an email out with that and uh, posted it on Facebook, and we'll try to get a hold of as many people as we can. As I said, today's focus is on our celebration of Life Sunday. Life is a gift. It's a gift for you. It's a gift for me. It's a gift that happens when babies are formed in the womb. Nobody chooses or asks to be born. It's God's gracious gift. Your life is a gift all the way through until your last day on earth. And he's the one that decides when that ends. And in that spirit, we will celebrate that wondrous gift of life today. 
Let's begin now with our, uh, oh, we need to do uh, this. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Share that gift with one another by raising your hand and looking left to right, front and back. Wave to the camera. And then let's not forget to wave to my good friend, uh, Pastor Hensler over here, who's hiding behind the banner. <laughs> with that, let's begin our worship with our opening hymn, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. Please stand if you're able. We worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have our opening versicles with responsive ravings. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us with your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, Response of Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. And are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. If it is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day. For the darkness is as light as the For you formed my inward parts. 
I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. On this special Life Sunday, our first reading comes to us from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth. And every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Our second reading comes to us from the book of Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at the third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose, purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, <clears throat> making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of your inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand if you're able. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up and in order to test him asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. But therefore, God is joined together. Let no man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this manner. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the re disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belonged the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We continue with our sponsor, responsory. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the meditation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the meditation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. We sing our creedal hymn, In God We Believe.
Please be seated. We will uh, forego the children's message this morning and continue on with our sermon hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this morning is entitled, Who is Worthy of His Kingdom? And it's drawn from our gospel reading, particularly verses 13 through 16. To start us off, as always, my thoughts went back to my time as a manager at Hiller's. And one of my least favorite jobs was to hire people to work there. And it wasn't so much a matter of meeting people. I mean, I didn't mind that. It was hard. It was hard to find worthy applicants that actually wanted to come to work. Now, unlike now, we didn't need to put a sign up on the outside of the door saying help wanted. I think if there was only once or twice we ever put an ad in the newspaper asking for applications, you had people coming in. The problem is the quality. The quality of who was coming in and filling out applications just wasn't quite what we needed it to be. It was a struggle because my bosses, them at the main office, they thought you could just snap your fingers and you could get employees. They would come in and say, you're shorthanded, you need help, go hire somebody. Well, sure. Do you want to come in and sit down and meet some of these people that were coming in? And there was a problem. You wanted to hire some employees that would actually show up for work. There were plenty that would come and fill out applications, unlike now. But when it came to coming into work, you mean I got to work on the weekend? You mean I have to work Saturday night and Sunday? That was a problem. You didn't want to hire somebody and have them not show up. What good is that? So you had to have some kind of weeding out process. You had to figure out who was worthy of actually being an employee there. Because once you got them in, and once they got in the union, it would be hard to get rid of them. Really, to try to figure out who was worthy, it wasn't always that hard. 
because those people that were coming in just weren't very smart. They would come in dressed more like they should be at a party or maybe as a a strip club as opposed to coming in and working. They would come in stinking of B.O., unshaven, unwashed. I mean, come on. Can you at least spend some time getting ready for an interview? And then there were those that came in and you could just smell the alcohol on their breath. Yeah, I'm going to hire you. Or even worse, reeking of that verdant weed known as marijuana. Eyes bloodshot red. What you do in your own time is one thing. But can you at least set aside time to be straight and work? If you can't set aside time to come in straight to have an interview, you're probably not going to do it when I hire you. And then we got a gift from the internet called MySpace, and what came after that, Facebook. We were told to check Facebook before we hired somebody. And believe it or not, especially at that time, it was a good source because people will post what they did last night or the night before. And often, it was illegal. Or at least it's the kind of thing you didn't want them doing at work. And so, I would have to weed out those that were worthy and weren't. And believe it or not, people would come in thinking that just because they showed up to fill out an application or to have an interview that I had to hire them, that I had to hire them, that we were beholden to give them a job because everybody's supposed to have a job. No. It's a privilege. In a way, it's a gift to be hired and have a job. How about when it comes to who's worthy to be in Christ's kingdom? Do we ever, do Christians ever make value judgments on who's worthy and who isn't? Do we, as Christians, ever make value judgment on who should receive the gospel message and who shouldn't? How eager are we to reach out to those that don't look like us, don't dress like us, don't talk like us, don't vote like us, don't share our opinions on things. And if that's the case, how would Jesus feel about that? Well, let's look at how he felt about what the disciples were doing in our gospel reading. Jesus had been teaching the people, and the Pharisees came up with a question that was trying to trap him about divorce. Jesus, in his response, holds up what we find in Genesis 1. God created the man and woman. And then in Genesis 2, brought the man, woman to the man and the two become one and let them not part. Man and woman together were fit to do the job that Jesus gave them in Genesis 1. Certainly to procreate, to continue on humanity, but also to have dominion, to rule over the fish of the sea and the bird of the sky and the animals on the ground in a loving way that showed that this was God's creation for us to manage. He upholds that plan. And then we see him going in the house and the disciples kind of check with him because they're worried about this. After all, Moses had allowed people to divorce and Jesus is kind of saying, well, yeah, he did that because you're a sinner, you're hard-hearted, but that was never God's plan from the beginning. And then we have parents bringing children to see Jesus. Children, which is the reason why man and woman come together to have children. God's plan from the beginning. And the parents are bringing them and the disciples are saying, nope, uh uh-uh, not time. How does Jesus feel about that? He's irate. He's angry. Why? Why is that? Well, why were the parents bringing those children in the first place? You can look at it in a couple different ways. One is it's kind of like, and I thought back to when you take the kids to go see Santa Claus in the mall. Why'd you do that? My kids, when I put them on Santa's lap, they were scared. I got a great picture of both Ginny and Derek crying their eyes out because they're sitting on the lap of this strange dude with a long uh, white hair and a weird clothes. Why'd we do it? We did it for the photo op. We did it so we could have this great memory. 
Not for them. Is that why people are bringing kids to Jesus? So they feel better about it. So these kids can sit on Jesus' lap and the great rabbi puts a blessing on them so that in this life, everything will go right and perfect. Maybe. If that's the reason, and these kids that are coming, and by the way, the Greek word that describes these children would be kids that are seven and under, all the way to newborns. Are they going to interrupt Jesus' teaching? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are. The disciples are saying, hey, Mom and Dad, there's some important stuff going on here. Not the time to bring your kids for a photo op. Makes Jesus angry. Irate. Why? Well, maybe it's because he doesn't want the parents and the kids to feel bad, to feel left out. Isn't that what's in our culture today? I mean, you look at sports. Sports nowadays in school. Who gets a trophy? Everyone. Why? Well, those that win, they get a trophy. Those that participated get a trophy. Because we don't want Johnny to feel sad and left out. We don't want mom and dad to feel sad and left out. Is that why Jesus is angry at the disciples? He doesn't want mom and dad to feel left out because their kid didn't come to sit on his lap. How do you feel about that everybody gets a trophy? I personally think it's a bad thing. I think it sets bad expectations for our children. I think one of the things we need to learn is not everybody's chosen, not everybody wins. Sometimes we lose, sometimes we suffer. If that's the reason for parents bringing their kids, I think I would join the disciples in saying no. But that's not the reason. Let's look at what Jesus says. When he sees what the disciples are doing, he's indignant, he's irate, he is teed off. And you can tell by his answer, and he answers in the positive and the negative. Let the children come to me, allow them. And then in the negative, do not hinder them, or more accurately, stop. Stop stopping them. What you're doing, disciples, is wrong. Why? Because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The kingdom of God. That makes it a life or death issue. Those that are in the kingdom have life now and eternal life to come. Those that are outside the kingdom don't have life with God now. And their end will be eternal death. Well then, what is the kingdom of God? Back in the day when Mark wrote, we would understand things better if we lived back then because there were kings and kingdoms, but we don't have that now. From seminary, I learned a better way to look at kingdom is the reign and rule of God. It's where Jesus is reigning and ruling. He came to earth born of a baby, and grew into a man to bring that reign and rule to those that he came in contact with. At the right hand of God now, he is reigning and ruling over everything. It just doesn't look like it. But where can we see his reign and rule most clearly? Right here. In your heart is where he's reigning and ruling. And he brings it to you in your baptism, through the gospel. In your baptism, where Jesus was truly present, his spirit in the water with the word, as the water was poured over your head three times, it was like Jesus reaching out and touching you, changing you forever. The work of the Holy Spirit. For those of you that came to faith outside of baptism, maybe later in life, it happens through the gospel, through the means of grace, the spirit present in your ears, and through the words of what Jesus has done for you, changing your life forever. Bringing the reign and rule of God into your heart. Before that, thanks to Adam, who was reigning and ruling? The devil. We were born into the devil's kingdom. We were born to do what makes the devil happiest, and that's please ourselves. 
Do what I want to do. I'll do what God wants to do if I like it. If not, I'm not going to do it. Or maybe I'll do it partially. Holy Spirit and the Word through the law comes and convicts us. Convicts us that how we're living stands opposed to what the Lord would have us do. He who created us, who knows how life is best lived, has laid it out in the law. Convicted. Our hearts hardened to live how we want to live. Convicted, the Spirit then brings the gospel to bear on our hearts and our minds. Through baptism, through the gospel. Forgiving you. Forgiving you for all the ways that you disobeyed. And because of that forgiveness, we can confess who we are before him. Sinners made saints. Made saints by the grace of God through the love of Jesus Christ. Through that work of the Holy Spirit that we call conversion, your heart is changed. You're given a new heart, a new will, one that wants to obey God all the time. And when you fail, the Spirit is there to point out that failure so you know you are forgiven. Conversion. It's a miracle. It happened in your heart, it happened in mine. It can happen in anybody's. Because the power of conversion is the Holy Spirit and there's not a person that he cannot convert, that he cannot change their life, cannot grant them the faith, which is the doorway to receive all that Jesus won for you on the cross. Forgiveness of sins, salvation out of the devil's kingdom. Conversion is the Holy Spirit grabbing you out of that kingdom and placing you in God's kingdom. Changing your eternal destiny from death apart from God to life with God now and eternal life to come. We call it redemption. It means a price had to be paid. It should have been paid by you, but it would have meant your death, your eternal death, was paid by Jesus, by his blood shed on the cross, and confirmed in his resurrection. The price has been paid. You have been placed firmly in God's kingdom as his precious child, firmly in his reign and rule, Firmly in his church. Firmly here before him. The kingdom of God is for you and for me. It is an intentional work and an intentional gift by God. It didn't just happen by chance. We have some great scripture passages in our other readings to point that out. First of all, Ephesians 1. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You, you were chosen before he ever created anything. Being God Almighty who knows all, he knew you. He knew that you would be born one day to your parents. He knew you would be born into sin. He knew that you would stand against him and oppose him in sin. Yet he intentionally, intentionally planned the day when you would be dragged out of the devil's kingdom and placed firmly in the kingdom of the Heavenly Father, the reign and rule of Christ. He did that out of love. He sent Jesus to redeem you out of love. On a day that he had preordained, whether it was at the baptismal font or it was the witness of a pastor or somebody else preaching the gospel, that day was set aside for you to change your eternal destiny forever. Intentional. Loving. For you. It's an amazing thing to think about what Psalm 139 says. God's eyes saw your unformed substance. In his book were written every single one of your days. The day you were born the day you came to faith, the days you were tempted and the days that the Holy Spirit would call you back through confession and absolution. There's not a single day in your life that he has not seen. And that includes the day when you depart from this earth. And he is at work to make sure when that day happens that his plan and purpose for you is fulfilled. Not that you have a wonderful existence on this earth, but that on your last day with your dying breath you hold fast to that baptismal faith 
that he is your Lord, that he is your Savior, and you have been made his precious child through the means of grace. An intentional work by God, not because you were worthy, but because he loves you so very much. He comes to make you worthy. Worthy of his kingdom. By giving you the perfect life of Christ, it is credited to you. And with that, you receive his greatest gift. His gift for all of those children that have made part of his family, eternal life to come. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Jesus is talking about that lack of worthiness in us. How do children receive the kingdom of God? Well, they don't make a conscious decision. Especially young children, they can't. Which is why we baptize infants. No one can choose to be a part of God's kingdom. It ain't going to happen. You're firmly in the devil's kingdom and you're enjoying it. You can't see the spiritual reality of God's kingdom until the Holy Spirit reveals it to you by faith. I wasn't worthy. You weren't worthy. It didn't happen because of anything I did or said. It happened because of God's love and his grace working in my life and working in yours. Yes, children are welcomed into the kingdom by God's grace through baptism, but anybody, anybody is welcomed only by grace. No one is worthy. So what does that mean for us as the church? What does it mean for the church when we make value decisions on how people look and act and talk? Well, it's one thing for me to make a value judgment on somebody I was hiring at Hiller's. It's another thing for me to make value judgments on who I want to fix my car, my house, who I'll entrust my savings with. When it comes to the greatest gift, when it comes to the kingdom of God and eternal life, who are we as Christians to judge who should be called into the kingdom and who shouldn't? We didn't deserve it. Certainly there are people that would, might walk in here that wouldn't deserve it. And we would balk because they look different, act different, talk different, vote different than we do. But in Jesus' eyes, they are just as worthy. He's intentionally working to bring them into the kingdom, just as he did with you. At times, we can be just like the disciples. Sorry, you're not worthy. Jesus doesn't have time for you. How did he feel about that with the disciples? Indignant. Irate. How does he feel when we do that? The same way, but there's this. For the disciples, there was forgiveness. For you, there is forgiveness. For that person who comes in just as unworthy as we were, there is forgiveness, there's grace, there's mercy, there's salvation, and there's eternal life. We've been put here as a church to share that wonderful gift of the gospel, especially those who are unworthy, because in that case, they're just like us. Who's worthy of being in the kingdom? None of us. We're made worthy through the means of grace, through the word preached, read, and sung, through the wonderful gift of baptism, where the Holy Spirit is poured into your life, and then that that place before God, that reign and rule of God is renewed when we have the sacrament of Holy Communion. God's intentional work for you and for me. Because what he wants from you is that on the last day, you die confessing his name, believing in him, knowing that you are a precious children of God. That's the gospel message. That's the assurance you have and I have. And on the way, when we have opportunity, we can share that assurance with others, whether we find them worthy or not, because Jesus came to bring that reign and rule in other people's hearts, in yours and mine, and to declare we are worthy of him, all by the work of Christ. Amen. At this point in our worship service, we would pass the offering plate, and as you know, we don't do that anymore. We don't want visitors to feel obligated to give, 
That's a decision that you make between you and Jesus. Those that would like to give an offering, whoever you are, there's a box out in the narthex as you leave. You can put one in there, an offering. You can put it in the box across from the office. You can mail it in or use our online giving portal. You can find that on our website. Our offering verse today comes from Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. I would invite you now to stand as you are able and let's sing of the great faithfulness and love that God has shown us through Jesus Christ. Congregation may be seated. You know what? Karen, yeah. Carrie, I skipped over a hymn, didn't I? I shouldn't have done that. Can we roll back and sing that now? We sing it so very seldom, but it's such a great song, and it goes right along with the sermon. Join me in singing Jesus Loves Me.
So the question of the moment is, does Jesus still love me for skipping this hymn? Join me in saying yes on three. One, two, three. Yes! Loves you despite your sin. And he showed that love in the intentional way that he sought you out, brought his kingdom to you being unworthy as you are, and drew him to himself to remain there forever. That's a wonderful love. And that's the love he has for you. Please join with me now as we pray the prayers of the church. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For all those in need, for the hungry and the homeless, for those undergoing strife and war, for the widowed and the orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For the sick and the dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For all those on our prayer list, as well as these for whom special prayers have been requested. For Connie Rao, for continued healing after her surgery, that the healing hand of the Lord would be upon her always, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For a friend of Jill and Gary, whose name is Heather, who's having spinal surgery for a tumor, that her surgery on Tuesday, that the healing hand of our Lord would be upon her through doctors and through medicine, and that she would receive complete restoration of health, let us pray to the Lord. For Allison Norrington, having a procedure on Monday, that the Lord would work through the doctors and the nurses and the medicine to restore her completely to health, to take away any fear that she has coming up with this procedure, that she would know that he is present with her. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For our brother Dale Norrington, who's having a test done this Thursday, that that test would reveal that he is continues to be lifted up and be healing and being restored to complete health. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For Melissa Metcalf, as she continues to mourn the sudden passing of her husband, that she would receive strength from her faith and that she would look to the promise of the resurrection to come for hope in the dark hours and times of grief in her life. Let us pray to the Lord. For all those celebrating birthdays this week, including Brian Trethway, actually birthdays this past week uh, with Brian, Brian Trethway last week, this week Jeffrey Pear, Jean Baird, Janine Libka, Madeline Grimm, Amy Rodabaugh, and William Carpenter, that they would all be kept safe, body and soul, unto eternal life to come. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We pray the collect of the day. Almighty and everlasting Father, you give your children many blessings, even though we are undeserving. In every trial and temptation, grant us steadfast confidence in your loving kindness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, One God, now and forever. Join me together as we pray Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, 
that the evil foe would have no power over me. Amen. I would invite you now to stand as you are able. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord our God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your Holy Spirit is leading us and your hand is supporting us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. You may be seated for the video anthem which will close our service.
would invite you back next Sunday when we will have our congregational meeting after the worship service. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. <laughs>